bring to order the uh, Thursday, February 27th, 2014 uh, meeting of the Board of Directors for the Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District. And uh, to begin this uh, meeting, I'd ask uh, Director Pearson to lead us in the pledge. Thank you, Director Pearson. The uh, Metro Cable announcement open session meeting is videotaped for cable cast on Metro Cable 14, replayed on Saturday, March 1st, 2014 at 1 p.m. and Monday, March 3rd, uh, 2014 at 6 p.m. on Channel 14, webcast at www.sacmetrocabletv. Uh, an opportunity is provided for the public to discuss matters of public interest within the district uh, jurisdiction, including items on and not on the agenda. Uh, and we have um, speaker cards for those who wish to address the board, and we will be uh, uh, using the three-minute uh, restriction on presentations. So move... Oh, and do you in fact have any for this evening? I, I believe one speaker wants to speak under the consent item, and then I have a couple speakers that want to wait and speak on, on, under the presentations. All right. So the person under the consent item is a Karen Klingfer. Klingfer, thank you. So with that, since we're at the consent agenda items, um, perhaps Ms. Klinger would like to come up and do that now? Board of Supervisors, the building. So that's really quite a bit to say. Um, under the consent items, I'm not quite sure how the agenda read. It was a little confusing for consent matters, action matters. So I'm going to be speaking on the presentation, and I believe there was another item where it talked about muni services. So I think I'm probably out of line to be speaking now. I need to speak later. Is that correct? Oh, well, um, Board Clerk, could you help us with that? Well, it said consent, but if you want to wait for the presentation, maybe yes. that would be better. Yes. That's Thank fine. You. Thank you. Thank you. Moving then to the consent items. Um, uh, pres President Orzali, we have an award to give first and then move into consent. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. You're absolutely right, Chief. Um, it is with a great pleasure and honor that I would like to ask Lee Bactel to please come up and join me at the podium. On February 19, 2014, Metro Fire Engine 65 and Medic 65 responded to Denny's Restaurant at 2474 Sunrise Boulevard uh, that morning for an unresponsive person. Engine 65 arrived to find a female bystander performing single rescuer CPR, including mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, on a 63-year-old disabled male subject with whom she was not acquainted. The presenting heart rhythm was V-fib, but the patient had a return of pulses and spontaneous breathing on arrival to Mercy San Juan. Captain Markell, who put this commendation in, later learned that the patient is related to Metro Firefighter Paramedic Chris Allen's wife. We believe the heroic actions of this individual, Ms. Bactel, contributed to saving this person's life and deserve to be recognized. 
So it is that, with that, it is a great honor that Metro Fire prevents to Ms. Lee Bechtel a certificate for life-saving commendation. This commendation is for extraordinary efforts to protect and preserve human life on February 19th, 2014. And a lot of people in life do not end up in a situation where they have to uh, perform CPR on somebody that they don't even know. Uh, nine out of 10 people would walk away the other direction or not even get in there and help out. And so, you know, when I say nine out of 10, it's probably like one out of a million or two million that would actually step in and do it. And so I can't tell you on behalf of the board of directors and on behalf of the district and myself as a fire chief how proud we are of you. And uh, with that, I'd like to present you with this life-saving commendation. First of all, I want to say thank you. This um, means more than you guys will ever know. Uh, I didn't think in elementary and junior high that this was going to be something I would ever have to use. Um, I want to also let it be known that um, my family has been my heart. My husband was there. He also helped. And um, my children are now learning what CPR really does mean and how it does affect the public. And um, with that, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart to each and every one of you. You have come to um, rescue my family on a few occasions. I lost my mother just 12 hours prior to this. And you guys had actually picked her up and taken her to the hospital. She didn't make it, but she went peacefully. And this, this I would say I would owe to my mother. She was my everything. And um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for everything you've ever done for everybody in the past and in the future. I really thank you with all my heart. And this means more than you'll ever know. Thank you. Um, Chief, 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 if <coughs> Chief, uh, well, absolutely, we would would love to have uh, board members in involved in this uh, photograph. If Meetings adjourned. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Hero coming through. Yeah, that's right. All right. And then I'm coming after all you guys too. So you guys get Worked it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to my angel. Uh, All right. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have to get more for this. Yeah, I haven't. You know, unless there's a big buffet, I'm not going to these <laughs> shoot photo shoots. Metro Fire has one they got. Hopefully it does.
Our, our thanks and, con and congratulations uh, on what you've done. It, it is inspiring to work with uh, Metro Fire every day and to see citizens make this contribution is just a, an added bonus. Moving then to the uh, consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Chair, I so move. Second. I have a motion and a second. Um, Madam Clerk, if you'd call the uh, roll, please. Director Smunk. I'm going to abstain. Wood. Aye. Scheidegger. Aye. Gould. Aye. Pearson. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Motion passes. Um, we have uh, an, a, an item to go to um, a closed session about, so at this point we're going to adjourn to closed session and um, we'll return shortly. Bringing the um, uh, board meeting back into session. Um, and Chief, did you want to report out on that? I now? did. Under closed session, item number one, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9B, one case, claim against public entity pursuant to government code section 910. Attorney Michael Lowen on behalf of Ms. Crystal Lane, individually on behalf of decedent Mr. George Lane versus Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District. Uh, in closed session, the vote was 8-0 to deny the claim. On closed session, item number two, pursuant to government code section 54956.9A-1, one matter of industrial disability retirement in one matter of workers' compensation settlement authority, Gordon MD and Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District, Claim number SMDF 536836, Industrial Disability Retirement and Settlement Authority. In order to settle, the vote on that was 8-0 by the Board of Directors. The action on the IDR will be held under uh, action items later in the meeting. And that concludes my report out from closed session. Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> Moving then to uh, presentations. Um, Chief? Yes, sir. I will be uh, leading off the presentation on this item, and I would like to uh, read into the record before I start a PowerPoint presentation um, the letter that I sent to the Board of Directors for Public Consumption. Tonight, you'll be receiving a presentation of a draft fire suppression assessment engineer's report and review to service review, a revenue to service review. To address a significant drop in property tax revenue since 2008, the district has reduced operational cost, increased efficiency measures, and maximized cost recovery efforts. The closure of six engine companies necessary to align expenditures with lower revenues has reduced the district's emergency response capacity and negatively impacted its response time performance, which is deficient when measured against national best practices and this owns board's adopted policies. With the recovery in property tax revenues projected to lag behind other signs of economic recovery while calls for service increase, the district continues to examine options for supplemental revenue resources. A citizens advisory committee was conven convened in October of 2012 to review the district operations and financial issues and to advise the district on its options. For more than a year, this committee engaged with senior staff to develop an approach that considered fairness and equity balanced with a demonstrated need to improve community safety. This committee was provided an update in January of 2014 on the progress of the effort and expressed support for moving this process forward. 
The enclosed reports by Wildan Financial Services, Perens Draft Fire Suppression Assessment Engineers Report in Perens, and City Gates Associates, Perens Revenue to Service Review in Perens, are separate but complementary studies of the fiscal, operational, and legal considerations attendant to the potential levy of a special fire benefit assessment. <clears throat> The draft assessment engineer's report describes a proposed plan including the services, budget, parcel breakdown, methodology, and corresponding assessments. The revenue to service review provides an objective look at the service delivery options for the district relative to current and forecast revenues and expenditures. With that, I would like to have the first slide brought up to kind of recap where the district uh, is at. For the public at home that is watching on TV and the public in the audience, I think this slide really tells the story not just about SAC Metro, but about the state of California and communities up and down uh, the state. But in direct relationship to us as Metro Fire, we are a property tax driven organization. That is where we receive a majority of our revenue to run the district to provide the services to our citizens. And if you, and this is a kind of a, a refreshment, if you look at the light blue, the property tax revenue from which fire suppression must be funded, must be funded out of property tax, um, you will notice that we had a precipitous drop off starting in 2008, 2009. And over those years, we ended up at about 22 million a year in lost property tax revenue on an annualized basis. You will notice that cost recovery fees, which is our ambulance service, and fire uh, uh, fees as far as fire prevention, we were able to recover a little bit of that. Um, but with that, if you see the spike that goes up right above the word recovery over the Y, uh, right around the 12, 13 year, that's because we reached further agreement with 522 and converted six ambulances that were being run privately to single role paramedic EMT ambulances, and therefore there was an expense that went that as, with that as well, but also an increase in cost recovery. Next issue. Here is a demonstration of what I like to refer to in 06, 07, 07, 08, as Alan Greenspan would say, irrational exuberance, where expenses under former uh, administrations did not meet um, the revenues that were coming in. But actions were taken very, very quickly uh, to address that issue, and they were brought back in line. If you look at 910 or 1011, you'll see that the red line blips slightly up. That is because we bought this building that you're in today for $6 million on the block uh, as it went into foreclosure. And the reason that we did that is because we had personnel spread throughout the 417 square miles and there was no efficiency in operation. It should be noted that about six months ago, we were offered $15 million for the building as it sits today. And more importantly, we leased the entire first floor of this building to Sutter IT, which makes our complete bond payment on this building through the lease agreement. So it was a business decision. Once we floated the bond, we paid ourselves back. The next rise in expenses and revenues has to do with that conversion to the single role paramedic program that we entered into. Next slide. You will hear about staff layoffs. You'll hear about redeployments, efficiencies. You'll hear about station closures. You're going to hear about massive labor concessions that we have been working on over the last four years. Not only did our labor unions give up 12% in guaranteed raises forever, no kicking the can down the road, forever, they also uh, took a 12% uh, contribution into their pension, which was a 12% pay cut. They then turned around and revamped for new, new employees' retirement and the salary schedules and the incentive schedules. They also forgo overtime incentives. And last but not least, they ended up pre-funding retiree medical. And as far as I know, we are one of the first agencies whereby not only did we cap our medical costs with the agreement of labor and management, but we all contribute 8% into pre-funding the retiree medical, and the people that contribute to that are not only active employees, but are retired employees. 
and that allows us to fully fund our annual required contribution on a go-forward basis for retiree medical. We also instituted a vesting schedule, so you no longer get to work here for six months and get full medical coverage. You have to work a complete 20 years, and you get 5% a year. We've explored grants. We got around 21 million in grants. Uh, that is only bridge money, though, that bridges the companies, and we can't count on that on an ongoing basis. We are in the last major grant, we're in the last year of it, that staffs two truck companies 24-7 for the public. We've updated our fee schedules and our permits and inspections. So we have explored a variety of issues and not talked about them, but actually in action uh, implemented them to save around $198 million in long-term savings to our district. Just in the issue of health care alone, we cut our unfunded liability by around $98 million a year. Next slide, please. Service delivery. The reason this slide's up there, to remind the public at home, is that you will see the, the vertical line, and above it is written flashover. This board of directors has adopted the best practices of the National Fire Protection Association to have a four-minute travel time to get to your call. What that means is we allow one minute to receive the call at the dispatch center, one minute for the crews to get on the rig, and four minutes to actually drive to your address, set the air brakes, and go to work on your problem. The reason we do that is because at that six to eight minute mark is when a room that has a small fire in it reaches the point at which the entire room flashes over and is involved in fire. And once that occurs, a fire scientifically doubles in size every 60 seconds. So it goes from that room to 60 seconds later to the next room. Our job is to get hose lines there, get water on the fire, stop that flashover process from occurring. It also so happens that if you stop breathing, at the six to eight minute mark, irreversible brain death starts to occur. And as we know, we, large a lar we run a large percentage of EMS calls, as do all all-risk fire agencies. So that flashover also has that time limit really, really sets it for EMS as well. So we're accomplishing both. Next slide. This is what's happened to our district. As we lost around $22 million in tax revenue, we closed six engine companies, we did all the labor concessions that we can, we can get. We've implemented all these cost cuts. From 2009 to 2013, our call volume a year has gone up by around 9,400 calls a year for service. That means that a busy engine company is around 2,000 calls a year for service for an engine company to handle that. That means why we should have been adding five or six companies, we actually closed five or six companies. And it is a fact that at any given time, 24 hours a day, we have a minimum of four units out on a call simultaneously. And normally during the daytime hours, we are upwards of 17 to 18 fire companies or ambulances that are simultaneously on calls out of 39. That is a very, very dangerous situation. And the call volume, it should be noted, is twofold. You will hear the media say that uh, Fires are less and EMS is more. Our fire volume continues to grow at 25 to 3% a year incidence of fire. The fact of the matter is our EMS calls are growing at a much larger rate of 4 to 5%. So our fire volume is not going down. It's increasing. It's just not increasing as fast as the EMS calls. And the bottom line is this before I turn it over to Mr. Stu Gary to talk about the CityGate report. Back in 2007, when I talked about that four-minute travel time to get to your call when you're not breathing, the lady that came up here and started CPR, four minutes to her is a lifetime or an eternity if you haven't done it. It's not something you can read in a book or you can judge by dollars or numbers. It's about real human lives that are there when that's happening. And what's happened to her is even in 2007, we only met that travel time 64% of the time. And today, in 2012, we're at 56% of the time. 
and we're crunching the numbers for 2013, which we expect to be less and have here in the future. This is a real problem. This is a problem that this district, the board of directors, the administration, and every man and woman that works for us has worked on globally to try to solve for our citizens. So with that, that's my opening comments. I would like to turn it over to the principal, Stu Gary, who will present the City Gate report to you tonight. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, members of the board, and uh, members of the audience. Stuart Gary, Fire Practice Principal for CityGate Associates. Well, you know I've been before you before doing deployment analysis for the board. This is a slightly different CityGate product tonight. This is a peer review of your internal fiscal teamwork, the peer review of external consultant work of property tax projections, and your cost of business over time. So in effect, it's a neutral third-party review of your ongoing fiscal work to maintain revenues and services in, in balance. While the report is comprehensive and full of facts, figures, and statistics, I'm gonna to talk tonight more in words about the highlights of the report and this not be statistics and, and uh, trauma by PowerPoint. Here's the bottom line, our key finding is, your long-term forecast or revenues to expenses indicates that at the modest level of economic recovery that housing and business property values are now seeing, the existing revenue base does not provide sufficient growth income to support even the now reduced levels of service. So let me say that again. Even coming out of the recession, with all of the cost containment you've done, with the closing of the six fire crews, you're still running a deficit. And as long as you run that deficit, restoring service is impossible, much less adding service to existing underserved neighborhoods. What occurred, the chief did, did a very good rundown in brief that the housing and economic meltdown triggered a multi-year reduction in that property tax assessment and in your fundamental revenue base. And while every agency in California experienced recession-driven reductions, tax, property tax-driven districts as yours were hit the hardest. Not only was your housing depression, recession deeper in other pockets of the state, but you had no other revenue resources other than a small slice of ambulance fees to balance your books on. Where a city maybe could get more sales tax, different user fees, and have a more diverse revenue portfolio. You live or die by the property tax. That comprises 72% of your revenue. So how did Metro respond? You reduced service in six engine companies, specialty programs such as the dozer operation for wildland suppression, your helicopter operations, your attrited headquarters positions. You laid off. The chief summarized all of the labor, personnel, benefit, salary, concessions you've done. You've actually been in the vanguard of the state in reducing employee costs and benefit co-share payments, but you lost so much property tax, it's still not enough to permanently bring revenues into alignment with expenses. Over a six-year period, as the chief stated, it's without a doubt your call volume is increasing while your response time performance is decreasing. The lines move in opposite directions and you're now roughly in the high 50, 55, 58 percentile of travel time performance at the fourth minute. And it's taking you over six minutes to get to 90% of the calls. As we've said in prior deployment studies, just as the recession were starting, you entered the recession short a few fire stations for existing neighborhoods. You then closed six on top of that. So we're gonna talk about where going forward, you might spend uh, new revenues. So the existing revenue and projected growth in property taxes won't even absorb your current cost of doing business five to seven years from now. And in fact, CityGate projects if you did nothing about the structural deficit, which you're not, you're correcting your labor costs, you could actually run into a cash flow projection problem 
in six or seven years because you only receive property taxes twice a year and in between property tax installments you won't have enough cash flow to make payroll if you spend our reserves to zero. So maintaining healthy reserve balances, controlling your employee expenses are going to be critical if not a single new dollar of revenue comes in and the HDL property tax projections would indicate you're not Marin County, you're not Palo Alto, you're not going to roar those property values back overnight in just two or three years. They're going to grow back very incrementally uh, in the Sacramento Valley region. Therefore, to restore first cut services and then add services, a new stable revenue source is going to be needed. And again, while you won't have a structural cash flow imbalance for maybe seven years, it's going to take continuing time to adjust your ongoing employee expenses to services. And this is really the forecursor of even if we do that, where do we find the money to restore services? So this graph says it all. In summary, uh, the blue line are your current expenses and just with cost of inflation, fuel, uh, employee costs, heating and lighting for the, for the buildings, increased call volumes as the chief stated. The blue line rises. The black line across the blue line is total revenue projected by your consultant's HDL as the economy recovers. Uh, and frankly, the black line doesn't rise as fast as the blue bars. It's strictly a structural deficit. The red on top of that is what it would cost to restore the services you closed to survive in the center of the hurricane of the recession. What would services restoration look like with additional revenues? You closed six companies and you were short at least two entering the recession. So that totals eight. A modest new revenue source would allow you to restore three closed engines to their original locations, relocate two of the closed engines to better locations where you had overlap before in prior uh, neighborhoods that were built separate to the merger of the district and the stations were a little too close together. So you could do better when you reopen those two, uh, two of those companies. Eventually move a re the remaining closed engine to another existing underserved area and then with new revenues add two companies to existing underserved area. Where would that look like specifically? I agree with staff that in the first incremental movement as revenues arise, you restore engine 26 and 106. The second fiscal year, restore closed engine 68. The third fiscal year, relocate a closed engine. The fourth year, relocate a closed engine. You're still not to eight added resources. But that's the general programming that as revenues slowly come on line, you can restore services. And with that, uh, uh, our summary of a, sadly a very complicated and painful uh, revenue to services report, I'd be happy to take your questions before we go into the assessment report. Any questions from the Board of Directors? I know you have the complete City Gate report in front of you. I also believe that uh, we have it on our website uh, for the public to be able to get it. And I believe I thought I saw some people from the public and we may have had them for the handout out there. So any questions from the Board of Directors on CityGate? Mr. Chair, I have a question. Please. Sir, you, you, hello. Thank you for your presentation to date. Um, you used an interesting term this evening that I think needs to be reinforced. And that is you said Vanguard. Could you be a little more specific about what you meant by that, given your extensive background and knowledge about fire service in California, please? The larger the property tax dependent fire district, you're one of the largest in the state off the top of my head that is solely property tax dependent. You had no choice to survive the recession other than to do two things, close services, and sit down with all candor with your employee groups and say, we will not survive this without restructuring pay and benefits over time. And it's not just a 12-month restructuring, but as the chief talked, it's picking up a share of pension forever. It's picking up a share of retiree and active health cost forever. And it's partnering in a new paradigm of what you can afford to pay. 
and, and you as a larger property tax dependent district aggressively moved into those discussions and your employee groups cooperated because you, should, in my opinion, showed leadership, transparency of the revenue, and you couldn't argue the numbers. And you did what many school districts did, but other units of local government had a little bit more time to deal with. Most school districts were also immediately killed by the state in the recession and had no choice but to watch cash flow, shed teaching jobs, raise class sizes to even provide some level of service. And you took very much the same approach to your employees. Here's the cash flow. Here's the headcount we can afford. We're going to put a tourniquet on the bleeding by closing six companies. That gets us a year's worth of time, and then you went and negotiated. So that's what I meant by Vanguard, is you exercised strong influence immediately to deal with the problem. There are agencies in the state who, in a Pollyanna sense, said, we'll grow out of this. Property tax will come back in three years. Look at the reserves we're sitting on. They spent their reserves to zero. They exhausted their re replacement funds. Then they tried to negotiate uh, pay and benefit savings. You tried to keep your budget healthy. You needed to buy fuel and repair fire trucks at the same time, keep stations open, so you and the employees worked together. So in your opinion, since this issue hit us in 2007, we've taken an aggressive leadership, set the model, as it were, for the state given like agencies. Yes. And even given that leadership, it can't close the gap. Your property taxes fell that far. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair? Okay, thank you. I would like to reemphasize a point that the chief made, and I think Mr. Gary also made within this presentation, is that this com I've heard the comment a lot about how, oh, you don't have so many fires anymore. And that is a total misnomer. It was back in the 70s when I think when we threw an oxygen tank on the trucks and started to do dispatch for first aid calls. That evolved into EMT response and that evolved into paramedics and ambulance transport. And it's very, very important for me as a retired firefighter to let folks know that call volumes have only increased. When I first came on, the first year it was a big bet if it was going to break 20,000 calls a year. And we're well over 80,000 now a few decades later. The trend is just going up. And so against the backdrop of all these concerns, one needs to realize that the workload, the call volume, is constantly going up. And that is a huge factor in the necessity for us to increase services. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, one, one comment. I, I noticed in looking at the uh, uh, chart or the table uh, that refers to the percentage of, um, of compliant goals, reading that 90% goal, starting uh, in 2007, it shows us at 64% and presently, or 2012, at 56 percent. What's intriguing to me is as those um, numbers uh, ascend to the present time, are we still at 56 percent? This was 2012. Uh, do we have a sense of where we are right now? No, we're just because we just closed 2013, we're just now running those statistics, and the staff will have an update for you a moment. <laughs> Not momentarily, but in, in a few weeks, as to what the 2013 uh, per response performance is, and we can append that table. And now, one, one, one last point. The, in the uh, period between uh, 2011 and 2012, we had a 3% drop in, uh, in our compliant response times. Um, most of the others were 1%, 2%, but that particular year there was a drop of 3%. Is there any conjecture about whether that's an, uh, an ascending trend as it seems to be that our, our response times will continue to grow wider? Your response times will continue to decay, but the line won't be smooth because there's a certain amount of randomness to where calls occur. Okay. So you could have an increase in calls per year but if most of that increase occurs very close to existing stations, your response times look fairly healthy. 
If that increase in calls is in the underserved neighborhoods, much further from fire stations, mm -hmm. your response times could decay dramatically in a single year. So we look at where the calls occur in relation to your responsibility and internally to the statistics, we understand what that variability, whether it's due to random location of calls or a real decay. The chief mentioned simultaneous calls for service. That's the real driver of decay over time because at peak hours of the day, you just cease having enough resources available immediately to go to successive calls in one uh, or two neighborhood areas. Thank you. One other. And now, on those percentages, that's for the first arriving company of three people, is that correct? That's, that's correct. So the balance of the assignment to where they can actually do work and effectively do a rescue and put the fire out could be substantially longer than the six minutes. And, and when the report says you, you're uh, somewhat over, not, not as badly, but you're over your first alarm or three engines, truck, and a chief response time measure of eight minutes, you're getting to 90% of the calls off the top of my head at minute 11 something. I don't have that slide in front of me. And the preferred I, I response time would be eight travel minutes for all of the units to a serious emergency. And you're getting there upwards of minute 12. And again, that's very location dependent. The outer neighborhoods with further apart fire station spacing and maybe a closed station uh, in the middle of that multi-unit response could have much worse response times. Thank you, Director Shattiger. Thank you. Uh, you know, the Chief's comments and, and your very fine report um, very clearly document the efforts that we've made to uh, continue to provide a level of service uh, the best that we can with the decreased revenues. I think an important point that's made here is on page two, the chart where you project the revenue and the expenditures. And I, I think it's important for the public to understand that, uh, you know, you can look at the red line and the blue line, you can say, well, why don't you just decrease expenditures? And that's where this presentation comes together and, and shows the importance of the measures that we've taken to decrease expenditures, the, the, uh, the give backs, if you will, that, that our labor has given and, and uh, the very good management that we've made um, to, to try to reduce costs. The point is the service level is going down and in spite of all these measures we've taken and in spite of the probability of increased revenue from our tax base, we're not going to get there unless we do something else. I think that's the question on the table. That, that, that's correct. And in fact, had you not taken the aggressive measures in a somewhat simplistic, but not over the top sense, had this board done nothing for five years, you'd be going the way of Stockton and the city of San Bernardino. And you'd be looking at some kind of restructuring in bankruptcy be, because you couldn't have paid uh, your bills and made, made payroll between property tax installments. It, it, your, your problem was that severe, and to your board's credit, you at this moment in time, as the chief slides show, your revenues and expenses are just about in alignment. But it doesn't take much of a cost at your size operation and diesel fuel, utility, overtime for serious fires to drive that gap back into a structural deficit. Or a CalPERS increase or a health care increase that'll happen in the next five years. Mr. Chair, uh, Sir, you know, I know we're talking tonight about the impact that this has had on Metro Fire and our call volumes, and I get all of that. In the report, I think it's important to also give the public the idea that we aren't even talking about what we do for other agencies to help lift them up during their equally troubling issues. And so as an agency of our size, oftentimes we're asked to support other agencies at the same time. And while we're addressing just what's going on in Metro's jurisdiction right now, I think it's important for the public to understand that, that Metro does a tremendous amount of response and support of other agencies in this area. And that's not even addressed here. And so if you don't address our own internal needs, then we stop having the ability to even help out other agencies in the area, and then the problem even gets bigger and more problematic for the entire region. And that's where I don't, we haven't addressed it. But I think it's important to understand, we've got to fix what's going on in our own house because so much of what we do also is supporting other agencies and other citizens in this region because of the size of who we are and the capabilities that we have and the benefits. And we've got to continue to do that, frankly, because if we don't, there are some agencies around that'll be in a lot 
worse shape because we can no longer come to their aid when they need it. And it's very un unpredictable, but that's a real issue that we've got to address here. So, uh, you know, I know it's not talked about, but I think it's important that we, it's beyond Metro Fire most of the time too. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One, one more point, please. Also on this, to, to further go in and so the public understands what we've done. I mean, we have a 3-0 staffing, is that correct, on most of our engines? And correct. Wouldn't it be fair to say NFPA recommends 4-0 on their engines? So we're already one person down on every piece of equipment that we roll out of here. So we have that whole cost savings involved. And then, again, that's just more work for those three left to do. And then you compound that when you have our first alarm assignment, and you mentioned three engines, two trucks. So that's five people less. That's a whole nother, almost two companies that were short um, going to a structure fire. So I think it just compounds when you throw everything all into there and the numbers really show just how short we really are. I mean, uh, we can throw engine companies, but when you talk about bodies, we're extremely short on scene. And I'd like to close with that's, all the comments are, are appropriate and spot on and tie this back to what the chief opened with. And that's the time over temperature curve and how fast fire progresses. <clears throat> it's very popular right now up and down the state to say, well, two thirds plus the fire service workload's gone to EMS. Let's just restructure and only cover EMS calls, which in particular cluster during daylight, the awake hours of the preponderance of the population. Fire service in this country has historically been viewed as similar to life insurance. You hope you never need it, but if you need it, you need it very quickly to keep your fire from spreading to the neighbor's property. So as you try to attrit and balance staffing to the EMS workload, you've already closed six neighborhood fire stations. More would have to be closed to to continue to fix your structural deficit. At some point, while it sounds good that we're getting to the EMS calls, your neighborhood-based fire company attack ability is so stressed, almost every serious fire goes to greater alarm and adjoining property proportions, and is that the level of service we want? Most of us, I think, citizens would answer the question, I like having a neighborhood-based fire engine 24-7, 365 to at least come and keep small fires small. Otherwise, you're going to send more resources from a greater distance. They'll get there in a losing battle. So I think we very much have to, uh, those of us in fire service leadership positions, understand that if we move all the resources to EMS, it is going to have a firefighting outcome deficit and if that's what the public wants, then that's what the public uh, can, can pay for. But if they want what they've experienced for 100 plus years, they ought to be thinking about what level of baseline, neighborhood, 24 seven standby fire attack. Even though it's expensive, even though I only use it twice a month, do I want that protection resident in my neighborhood? That's going to cost money if that's the level of service they want. Further questions? Thank you, sir. With that, uh, next we will have uh, Mr. McGuire and Deputy Chief uh, Holbrook who will present the draft engineer's report on the fire suppression <coughs> assessment. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, uh, as this, oops, that's what I get for putting them on. As this presentation goes along, uh, because of the complexity of it, we've also brought in a Proposition 218, uh, our legal counsel for that, and that is Mark Mandel sitting here. So if there are any questions that you want to aggregate for the conclusion of the presentation relative to legal, uh, Mr. Mandel will be here as well. So, Mr. McGuire. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Jim McGuire. I work for Wildan Financial Services. And what we're here, what I'm here to talk about tonight is the proposed possible fire assessment. I have my glasses on. Can't even <laughs> see the keyboard. <laughs> if 
before I go into how the assessments are calculated and what we're looking at in terms of a proposed assessment, it's, I think it's important to cover some, some basic principles about assessment law. Assessment laws are subject to state law, in particular the fire suppression assessment law and the provisions of Proposition 218, which are constitutional. Uh, assessments must be based on special benefit conferred to real property. That's all they can be for. Um, key, key to this is developing a nexus between the services provided and the properties being assessed. You can assess for benefit received by people, residents, public at large. Assessments must not exceed the amount of proportional benefit to those properties. The assessment metho methodology developed to spread the operational costs must be the, for the benefits to those properties. On top of that, the general benefits must be identified, quantified, and separated from the cost that you're going to levy for assessments. You can only levy for special benefits. Unlike taxes, which a lot of government agencies are exempt from them, they are not exempt from assessments. So publicly owned properties would be assessed based on their proportional benefit just like any other property. Approval through majority protest is how the assessments are actually established. We go through the process of developing the engineer's report, the nexus, all the, all the fine tuning and technical end of what the assessments need to be, but ultimately it needs to be voted on by the property owners. It's a simple majority voter approval by mail ballot. Uh, the ballots are weighted based on dollar amount. So if I have a $100 um, charge and you have a $200 charge, you get a 200 vote, I get a 100 vote. But again, it's only based on those ballots returned. Fire assessments. Fire assessments are pretty restrictive in what they can fund. You can fund operating, for, uh, furnishing, operating, maintaining and fire suppression equipment and apparatus, salaries and benefits uh, for fire personnel, but it's limited to real property special benefits. So it's not a case of developing a fire assessment to cover 100% of your fire, uh, fire assessment costs. It can only be for those costs associated directly with property. Assessments cannot fund EMS expenses. Clearly that's a benefit to people, not to property. Uh, wages, services, and supplies that are non-fire related. Uh, so all, basically all medical costs, a significant portion of your administrative costs and overhead can't be funded. Um, it is really specific to um, property and fire suppression. You also can't fund, as I had said before, general benefits. Those have to be identified and excluded from, from the fee that your uh, assessment that you're planning to levy. Special benefit relationships need to be correlated to the property uh, and it's based on risk to those classifications of property type. So identifying the fire cost suppression efforts to different, different land, or land uses, utilizing factors that are identifiable, such as the building size, the acreage is the way that those are quantified. So to do that, the first step is to identify those costs and expenses that need to be excluded. So we've used your call data, which I've got to commend this district in having really good call data information. It's very unusual to find a, a fire district that has call data for more than two or three years. We had it for eight. That's a, that's a fairly substantial uh, pool to look at in terms of identifying where you've been spending the money over the years and where all the effort is. So one of the things that I had identified before that you can't use the fire suppression assessment for is for wages and uh, services and supplies that are non-fire related. So this assessment can't be to cover your EMS costs. Those are right off the top, off the board. They're not something this can that the assessments can fund. We can't also fund general benefits. And in your particular case, through the call data, we were able to identify what those general benefits are. Mutual aid being responses to properties outside the district or helping other agencies. Those costs are general benefit to the public at large or to properties outside the district and so they can't be something that we can include in the fire assessment. Wildfires. 
fires that are, are generally exceed 24 hours in total effort uh, of the department. And we've discovered through looking at all the call data that tends to be at 150 acres. Once it gets beyond that, we're pretty much into a 24 hour or more uh, fire. And so those tend to be more of a general benefit to the public at large. Granted, they are a benefit to the particular properties involved, but on a large scale, it's more of a general benefit to the community. And so those costs, we identified how many calls, the effort deployed to do that, and excluded those. Um, community benefit, just overall general benefits that the public receives. By you taking care of fires, we don't have a whole lot of smoke. By taking care of land fires, we don't have so much erosion. There's no community interruptions. All of those things are somewhat general benefit, although very difficult to quantify. Reasonably, they are a general benefit that you have to discount. So all in all, all those factors gets us to, by identifying what we need to exclude, we've now somewhat identified what are eligible expenses that can be collected under a fire assessment. This is gonna be a little difficult to read if you uh, for those in the audience maybe because the print's a little small, but in essence, this is just what I was talking about. We went through the salaries and benefits that the age, that you guys uh, pay, uh, identified those that are indirect administrative support costs. Those come out, those are excluded. Uh, Non-fire related EMS costs that are clearly nothing but EMS, those are pulled out and excluded. Um, fire suppression specific costs, those are all included. So those shift to the, to the side of what we can. Those that were mutual, which is a lot of your uh, uh, operation staff, they are both EMS and firefighters. So those costs were spread based on the call data. In looking in that and the total efforts that were involved, we came up with a percentage ratio of about 78% EMS, 22% being for fire. Again, fire specific to property, although the fire related calls may have been more if we couldn't identify it to a particular type of property or it was a call for um, a fire, a fire at a, um, for a car, those types of things are excluded. And so in that ratio in the call data, we were able to identify about 22% being specifically to properties. So that's why we use that ratio. We applied that same ratio to operating supplies um, and services related to maintaining the trucks and equipment. Um, if you go down a little further, you can see uh, district overhead expenses and supplies were entirely excluded. So the cost mm -hmm. of this building is not something we can cover. That's all been pulled out. Uh, and then in addition to those clearly identifiable excluded cost, we end up with about $30,000 or $30 million that could be conceivably levied as a benefit. But then we have to take out all the general, general benefit costs that we talked about. That brings us another um, $2.7 million of general benefit costs that are excluded. So now we're down to about $27 million of eligible costs. In addition to those direct costs, obviously in establishing an assessment district of any type, you're gonna have administrative overhead and incidental expenses that are authorized under the law. So what the county's gonna charge you to put the assessment on the tax rolls, administrative for doing engineer's reports each year, doing all the things that have to be done for data updates, spreading the assessments, putting them on the tax rolls, as well as the district's overhead costs related to the assessment itself, those all can be added. You add those to the, add those to the, the $27 million, and then from that, we end up with approximately um, $27,720,000. You can see the administration costs are not terribly high, but they still are part of what can be levied as part of the assessment. Then from that, we're making a district contribution towards reducing that, look, bringing a $15,700,000 $15, 
to bring the total amount that we're looking at to levy as a potential assessment of $12 million. Now within this, I had made the statement before that you can't exclude government parcels. There is one exception to that. Under fire assessment law, SRA properties that are undeveloped cannot be levied an assessment. But because they still benefit, the agency needs to make a contribution to pay for their assessments that they would have otherwise had to pay. And that's an amount of about $254,000. Again, it's otherwise what you would be doing is shifting that cost onto everybody else, which is not legal. You have to, you have to make up that particular assessment. So ultimately what will end up on the tax rolls is about 11700000 But the assessments are based on that original $12 million. Then based on the effort and the call data that we went through, all these calls were identified and related to particular types of property. So we took that $12 million and spread it to the different land uses within the district based on the percentage of their effort that was applied to them. Now in this, it's interesting in this that you can see that 43% of the effort was expended on single family residentials, although they are 90% of your properties. So the effort is the real key, not how many parcels are out there. It's where the fire services are being provided to properties. And so the dollar amounts of the budget are allocated to those different land use classifications. Then within those land use classifications, we proportionally spread the special benefit to the properties based on their characteristics using building square footage and acreage of those properties. We have implemented a sliding scale, partly because when you look at a, a fire response, up to a certain size building, you're gonna have a certain amount of response. As that increases, it, for every 10,000 square feet of building, you don't send keep doubling the amount of effort that you're, or uh, service engines that you're putting out there, it incrementally increases. So using a sliding scale is a good reflection of those efforts. Same sliding scale applies to um, acreage, but we use five acre increments in doing that, up to 150 acres. Um, using those those numbers that you come up with for each property based on their building square footages and their acreages, those are divided into the budgets that we've allocated to come up with the assessment rates for building, for building assessment rate and an acreage assessment rate. Those being applied to all the properties in the district, you come up with an actual assessment per EBU. And I'll kind of explain this a little bit just in using a single family residential. A single family residential that is 2,000 square feet, we divide that by 100 to come up with 200 benefit units, or, or 20 benefit units, I'm sorry. And then that's multiplied by the rate of $1.65 to come up with their assessment. And if they have acreage in excess of one acre, the acreage rate applies to that excess acreage above one acre. And that's, these rates are all, again, driven by the amount of um, benefit units calculated for that land category divided into the budget. That's how you get to these rates. Ultimately, when it's all spread out, the $12 million is allocated based on this, on this particular table and it shows you what the results of those assessments would be. Approximately 6.6 .6 million would be coming from single family residentials and I, I don't, won't go through all, each and every one of them. I mean, you can see the table and you've seen the engineer's report. And so I'd be happy to answer any questions. I tried to keep it simple. This is actually a very complicated methodology, but I wanted to get the basics out there and then b answer whatever questions you may have. Please. One, <clears throat> one quick question on it. Uh, you have put a lot of work into it, and I appreciate that. Um, in breaking it down for the building specifically, was there any allocation given for consideration to the protection systems in those buildings? No. Okay. No. That is certainly a factor that can be used, but on a district of this scale, that's almost impossible to do. 
um, in terms of, of identifying each one, each building that may have a particular um, um, fire support service of their own, you know, in terms of sprinklers or whatever. However, using the sliding scale does more than compensate for that. It's not the single family residentials that are all, you know, 5,000 square feet or smaller that have sprinklers. It's going to be your larger commercial industrial buildings that have those sprinkler systems. And because we use a tiering in terms of the building square footage, to incrementally decreasing the amount per square foot they're paying for, we're recognizing the fact that those types of buildings typically have fire suppression systems. Sure. Please. M might be a legal question, but uh, on the, uh, you told us what we could spend it for, what we couldn't spend it for. If this was to sunset and we've identified those engine companies that we were going to put in place, when it sunsets, are those tied to this assessment and then therefore we have to specifically close those companies? No. Um, again, this is a rev becomes a revenue source just like your um, property taxes are. How you utilize that money, I mean the whole point of having this assessment is to is to fill this gap that has been identified. Ultimately, and we and this assessment is being proposed for a 10-year period, and it will sunset at the end of 10 years. Um, if if we still need the revenue source, we'll have to go back out to ballot and bring it forth to the property owners again to renew it. The concept is we're hoping, as economies go, that 10 years out, the economy is better, your property taxes are back up, and the fact that this then sunsets, we're going to be in a position to still maintain that level of service going forward. Director Wood? This may be a question better for uh, Mr. Mandel, is it? Um, could you just give us a quick, I know Prop 18 is an extremely complicated uh, area of the law, could you give us just a quick layman's timeline, procedures, the steps we got to go through just to make sure we know what we're getting into? Sure. Um, Proposition 218 has two sets of requirements. Uh, there's substantive requirements and procedural requirements. Uh, the procedural requirements are that um, at least you need to hold a public hearing and at least 45 days before that public hearing you need to mail notice of the proposed assessment and the ballot to every property owner who will be affected by the assessment. Uh, the ballot shows the amount, the dollar amount of the assessment on it, and um, that's the amount that the vote is weighted by. Um, those ballots need to be returned back to the district by the public hearing. Um, technically, it's by the end of the uh, public comment portion of the public hearing. So if folks want to, they can actually bring them to the hearing, listen to the comments at the hearing, and then vote at the end but most of your ballots, of course, will be coming in in the mail. Um, then after you've held the hearing, um, the balloting period closes. Um, with a district this large, you can't count the ballots right there. So uh, what will happen is uh, uh, Mr. McGuire and some people from his firm, as well as district staff, will uh, the next day go through, open all the envelopes, scan all the ballots, and determine what the vote is. Uh, then as long as the ballots in favor are not exceeded by the ballots opposed, um, at your next meeting you're able to go forward and impose the assessment. Um, then the other side of Prop 218, which is the substantive requirements, is basically a set of requirements that are related to making sure that each person, each property owner who's assessed is only paying their fair share of the service that's assessed. And um, Jim talked about most of those requirements already, but basically the main requirement is that you need to separate the benefits of the service into special benefit and general benefit, and only special benefits can be um, funded. Now with this district, since what's happening is we're not funding a discrete new service. Instead, we're funding a portion of your overall fire suppression efforts. We're actually funding with the proposed assessment quite a bit less than the total special benefit. Um, that's what Jim was referring to as a contribution. Really, that contribution is just you don't need to raise that money from the assessment because you're going to meet that obligation out of your existing revenues, basically out of your property taxes. Um, so 
uh, to a large extent the special and general benefit uh, calculations as well as the other process which is eliminating the things that you can't fund because of the restriction in the fire suppression assessment law is basically an exercise to go through look at all the costs of the district figure out which ones are eligible for assessment figure out how to split that equitably amongst property owners and then that is setting the maximum amount of assessment you could legally assess and in fact um, the proposed assessment is I think between a third and half of that amount because uh, you obviously do have a large amount of existing revenues and the point of this isn't to fund all of your fire services it's to give you some additional money thank okay. you very much yeah. please uh, thank you mr. chair I would like to thank you and acknowledge the uh, extensive background research that was necessary for the assessment analysis that you gave us in your report. Uh, for those that, well, it, it uh, confirmed for me that uh, there was really no one place to go and get accurate, up-to-date information about parcels, acreage, square footage, usage, etc. So just to get the base analysis, all the statistics that go into, the numbers that go into uh, this project, it's a tremendous amount of data input and research. And I want very much to acknowledge that and to thank you. I, I would just add to that if I could that when we had 207,000 parcels, 210,000 parcels, when we started this project three or four years ago looking at this, there was about 30% that even the county records didn't have what was there. So as engine companies were out doing inspections and stuff like that, we identified parcels and they actually, as they drove by, said, what is on this parcel and that? And so this district has been able to obtain information, not just so much for this project, but for our ability to deliver uh, fire and emergency medical services for parcels that <clears throat> really had nothing recorded as far as accurately on what they are and that helps us uh, on our day-to-day -day operations that we do so it was an extremely heavy lift uh, for the staff that went out there and did that our community risk reduction people our engine companies uh, put a lot of work into this over the years to get to this point well in one last uh, uh, comment uh, first of all I want to thank you gentlemen this is an extraordinary report also, I want to compliment the staff and Chief Holbrook for every time I'm a little bit of a data net and every time I've asked for data, I've, they've been able to come up and tell me exactly what's going on and I find that to be um, extraordinary in organizations. Um, I, I came from an environment where we were lucky to know what day it was, let alone what happened yesterday. So uh, I, I appreciate this very much, and congratulations, guys. And I don't know if we have any public questions, or I think we have to take your public comments yeah. now. Okay, so at this point, we have two uh, speakers. Uh, first would be uh, Mr. Ken Payne. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ken Payne. I'm at uh, 1341 Meredith Way in Carmichael. Uh, this is my first meeting of the uh, Metro Board, and it's uh, impressive. Thank you very much. I'm normally wearing a couple of hats, uh, both of which you'd be interested in. Uh, one is the Sacramento Taxpayers Association, and the other is the Auburn Dam Council. You guys need both water and money. <laughs> <laughs> More water. And uh, t to, uh, tonight, I just had um, some questions on the calculation of the assessment from what I was reading. Um, as a result of the presentation, uh, at least one of the questions was answered, and that was on the, the assessment by acreage, that anything uh, would, uh, the, uh, the size, the property size would have to be more than an acre in order to receive the acreage assessment. And then on the, um, the other question may have been answered as well, the, the square footage 
the, you know, the, um, the benefit assessment unit um, for residential was 1.6509 and uh, wasn't clear that that w whether that was assessed um, by the square footage or by um, this, ev evidently this factor uh, dividing by uh, the square footage by a factor of, uh, is it 100? Or 100, okay. So, uh, <coughs> and then that's multiplied by the, uh, the EBU. Yeah, okay. That uh, should uh, uh, end my uh, questions for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Ms. Karen Kepler. Karen Klinger, thank you, it's I'm German. Um, I have, matter of fact, transparency is something that I think that that's lacking in most elected and government um, agencies. If we would have had these reports, if they would have been accessible on the internet for us to get, and if they are, I'm telling you it's very difficult to get this information from Metro Fire on the internet. There is nothing easy with your, it's not a friendly, consumer friendly type of um, computer information. Uh, um, speaking first to how uh, Metro Fire could save money, you said you paid six million for this, you could get 15 million, there's one that you could sell this. Fire, the police departments, which you're uh, renting 2101 Hurley Way to, is paying, you're going to be benefiting 90, a thousand from that every year. You have 62 <coughs> properties. Your Metro Fire has 62 properties. You need to sell those. You need to lease just like the fire, just like the sheriff's department, so the people don't have to continue to pay for improvements, taxes, and everything on those 62 parcels that you own. Leasing, matter of fact, is not a bad way for government, and the state does it all the time. That's one way you can save money. Another way that you can save money is, um, well, let's, let's just stop with that because I want to then go to the assessments, not lose any more time. There is no way the people can ever obtain 50% plus one protest votes out of 210,000 parcels. If it was 1,900, we may be able to get to the people to educate them, to let them know what this is all about. There is, this is impossible. Even if the people could get 105,000, weighted votes or whatever the amount you need, or let's say 105 out of the 210, um, that's impossible. Because within all of these boundaries, who fixes the formula for the amount of votes that each um, parcel can receive? Everything is counted, the votes are counted, with all government lands, buildings from city, county, state, federal, public lands and buildings, nonprofits, the people couldn't even get 50% plus one. And if you can, please give me the formula and let me see how it can be done, because I can tell you it cannot be done. The American River Parkway is 43,000 acres alone. Your boundaries, do they go into Folsom? Maybe not but that would be something that we'll have to see what boundaries you're using. But you have nine districts, nine districts. This is an unjust, immoral assessment that is going to be charged once again to the very people who went through the same recession as you, Metro Fire. I, I can't tell you how many people lost their homes and how many people are still hanging by a thread that need help. They don't need another assessment of $40. This is unconscionable, and I will be sending each of the board members, thank you, each of the board, board members' questions that I will hope that you will answer. And if I, could, if I could just remind you that your three minutes are up, please, please continue, but could you bring this to a conclusion in the next minute? Yes, I can. Thank you. But it's very sad that our California legislature and all of those who are elected don't represent the people and look to ways where you can cut money and this money is to fill a hole, to fill the gap, the way the public sees it, to pay for unfunded liabilities like pen pensions, workers' comp, workers' comp claims. This is the way we see it. This is the money that you need. It isn't for other costs and services. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, if I may just Please. address a, a couple points. 
Um, in regards to the <clears throat> leased property issue, we do run Metro Fire like a business. The taxpayer expects us uh, in this era to run it like a business. We have property that is uh, paid for, was paid for by the taxpayer. To sell it in a depressed market for one-time money would be a bad business decision on behalf of the taxpayer who we would have to answer to. So we have elected to take buildings that we have consolidated and moved out from and lease them out to other agencies which does derive an ongoing revenue up and beyond the expense of those buildings and is being funneled in to help support providing engine companies uh, to provide service out there to the community. So I think it's important for the public to know that uh, when you look at 62 properties, some of them are easements and stuff like that. It's not like we're land barons here. I think we, we need to be factual on that. But we are maximizing every uh, dollar that we can to make sure that we take that money and help with ongoing revenues, that ongoing revenues match ongoing expenditures. And in regards to the, the last statement about the legislature, I, I can't speak for them. Um, I have my disagreements on a regular basis with, with uh, other governmental agencies. But I want to say this. I met with some of the taxpayer uh, advocates uh, when I first got here. And one of the big issues was pension reform and health care. I sat with one of the ones that's world-renowned for about three hours, lives in our, our district. And it was about cutting those unfunded liabilities down. And it was about pre-funding retiree medical and cutting pension, unfunded pension. And what I want to say is this, is that we then worked with our employees and they have taken the largest contribution and participatory givebacks of any government employees that I know are public sector employees in the state of California uh, to tremendous sacrifice. We realize that people lost their houses. A lot of our own people lost their houses. And last but not least, the problem in our district is because so many foreclosures happened, they were resold under new tax rates, under Prop 13. The people moved into those. We still have to service the fire protection to those. The population is still there at 30, 40 percent less tax dollars coming in to be able to do that. The people didn't leave. The buildings weren't torn down. And so I would say that we have tried very, very hard, Mrs. Klinger, to meet those very points that you've brought up about government, this institution, this fire district, its employees, its board of directors, and its administration focus that on that every single hour of every single day. Thank you, Chief. We have an additional speaker. Mr. Brian Rice. President Orsali, Chief Hinkey, members of the board. Um, it's a very, very complicated issue. It, there's, it's not a simple answer, and it's certainly not an emotional decision. It's a factual decision on um, where the district stands and what the district may look like in the future. Um, but one of the things I wanted to bring home, I live at 3817 Regent Road in Division 7. And the issues that Mr. Gary discussed in the CityGate study and then um, the discussion on um, the assessment going forward, it actually does hit people in your communities and, and it actually hit me. And this is what I want you to think about as you um, consider your deliberation and your discussion, in May of 2012, I got one of those phone calls from my wife who was having chest pain. And she wanted to handle it one way, hung up, called 911. The first company that is, uh, the first fire engine fire station that is responsible to my house was out of service on an official assignment. The second one, which is on Marconi Avenue, was closed due to budget cuts. The third one was closed to uh, brownout on budget restraints. I got the fourth one. Everything worked out fine, but I think what you're being asked to look at and discuss district-wide 
it is um, a significant service issue and it really is about community safety and it's about firefighter safety. And if your community is safe and being safely protected, then the firefighters are also safe because that means that it's staffed appropriately. And I really think you need to look at it that way. This is a community safety issue. People will probably get very emotional about it and find themselves on both sides um, of the issue. It's community safety, community service issue. And I would think that every firefighter that's out in a fire station looks at the community they serve first. And that is the most important thing. As a resident, I demand that. I expect you to be highly trained, highly motivated, and there every time I call you. And for that, I will be there to personally support and, and try to make sure you have the tools that you need. So it's, it's a big issue. I'm glad the district is looking at it, and I'm glad that you're putting uh, the amount of time in to answer this kind of a question in a systematic, data-driven, real example-driven way and not emotional. So thank you. Thank you very much. With that, under uh, presentations, um, update on the community uh, wildfire protection plan. Okay, thank you everybody for taking the time to hear a progress report on the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. And President Rosali and uh, Chief Hinkey and members of senior staff and all the community members that are here today. Thank you for listening to me after a very uh, important meeting today. What the Community Wildfire Protection Plan set out to do was create a comprehensive risk assessment of all of Metro Fire's area as it relates to wildland fire and the potential risk and loss from such an incident in the district. We were provided a FEMA grant in the approximate number of a million dollars with a $200,000 match share from Metro Fire and an additional $800,000 from FEMA. And that was through the Assistance to Firefighters Grant Program in the subsection of Fire Prevention and Safety. The grant itself is funding a CWPP, Community Wildfire Protection Plan, that is a literary document which will be probably in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 pages long, very detailed, lots of information. But the secondary portion of that is our geo portal. And that's gonna be a living version that all of us are gonna have access to, to see the components, to see the risk assessments, the risk modeling, project areas, and also some operational tools that we might investigate in the future. Finally, there's also an environmental process that they'll undertake so that all the projects that we identify, things like vegetation clearance, uh, new policies, new directives, have vetted the appropriate processes and had the right communities uh, involvement. <coughs> We've had a very good consulting team. Uh, we used a scent environmental to prepare the environmental process. Intera Group, who is a uh, technology component. They're doing projects from the US Forest Service. They're also doing Department of Defense as well as several large fire departments in California in Colorado, like Orange County Fire Authority, Colorado Springs, LA County, and a few in Oregon, like Tualatin Valley. <clears throat> Finally, our last consultant was Wildland Resource Management, who's writing the CWPP component, and she's also written several of these across the country. There are three goals and objectives under the CWPP. Number one, it was to engage the community and also some of our non-governmental organizations, as well as our other government organizations as stakeholders and collaborators. What we do in the wildland fire arena is not limited to strictly fire, fire suppression. 
we have to ensure that number one, that the community knows what things can start fires. Number two, how they can mitigate a fire prior to it arriving and prepare their homes. And finally, how are we going to fight this fire? Are there certain things that we can do that might have a negative environmental impact or might have a positive environmental impact? Through this process, we've been able to identify those. <clears throat> so with that, collaboration with the community, prioritize fuel reduction, and address structural ignitability. And we'll go into each of those a little bit further th throughout this. The draft, the administrative draft of the CWPP is due March 7th. And throughout the month of March, myself, my staff, and Assistant Chief and Fire Marshal Bill Daniels will look through that and make adjustments and augments to it. The geo portal should be available for live viewing in April. And that will be, there'll be two components. There'll be a public portal where members of the public will be able to look at their particular property enter in certain attributes about it and determine a, a risk on that particular property. Internally, we'll have a much larger view and we'll be able to look at communities as a whole to determine whether or not this is an area that we want future mitigation in or if there's new projects that we should undertake. <clears throat> we will likely present this to you, the board, in either June or July, depending on the environmental process and the amount of comments that we get from the public. So far, we've held three stakeholder meetings, and I'd like to note uh, Director Jones for attending one of those as a member of her uh, homeowners association community group. We've held 12 one-day NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, workshops on reducing structural uh, fire risk, and one two-day course so far in that. <clears throat> we've had approximately 400 people attend those, as well as several of our own line personnel. Additionally, we're going to schedule three more of those two-day workshops, and those will be scheduled for April or May, depending on the instructor's availability. And for GeoPortal training, our entire operations division will be trained on that in April. And we're going to have the ability internally to do data collection on certain areas that we'd identify as target hazards, additionally pre-planning, and there will be a component that could allow for some incident management if we choose to go that route in the future. Overall, where our community stakeholders really become involved, especially Sacramento County Regional Parks, is with the wildfire planning and mitigation. One of our biggest partners is them, as well as the American River Parkway Foundation, and a lot of concerns and a lot of good points brought by them, as well as a lot of good informational sharing with mapping and other um, culturally sensitive areas such as burial sites, uh, certain uh, vegetative protected species that we need to be aware of. Through them, all of these groups, for instance, like Director Jones's community uh, HOA, as well as several others, we were able to identify a priority list of the most urgent needs for fuel reduction, for projects along the American River Parkway, for instance. And as we move forward, we're going to work with those partners and stakeholders to accomplish those, those feats. They all take money. Future grants are going to be the way that we're going to be able to successfully complete those. And with collaboration and the community involvement is really where we're going to be uh, successful and find that success. As I said, the jail portal will be able to have community interaction. They'll be able to look at their particular parcels. As you can see in the lower pictures, you can see some different colors. This is actually Orange County's geo portal. Uh, the different colors relate to different levels of risk, and that also relates to different amounts of vegetation pro projects and how those are going to be carried out in the future. As those are entered in, those are going to be available to anybody who's logged into the system at the time. It can be accessed through a desktop or mobile tablet, iPhones, smartphones any internet capable device. It's a cloud platform. And our, some of our other governmental partners will be able to access that as well. This particular grant started out as a planning process. That is all that we set out to do from April of last year until April 30th of this year. Through that, we're collecting all this information, we're putting together a really good plan, 
this next coming year, we're going to decide how are we going to go out and achieve the mechanisms that we're actually going to require and able to respond to all those and perform those priorities. <clears throat> A lot of the information we had relied on, I can't remember exactly which board member made it, but there was a lot of data, a lot of information. We were able to collect all that and put it into one spot. A lot of this is now centralized. Whereas we had to go to a lot of places to get it, and we always could, now it's all central. <clears throat> I'm gonna show a quick video. This will be descriptive of Orange County Fire Authority's public interaction, and ours will look very similar to it. What you can see right now is the mouse going to a particular area, and it's going to draw a circle or a perimeter around an area and bring up a community risk assessment report. And you can see the colors indicating higher risk for the more red to the yellow being more moderate. You can enter in information yourself to change certain attributes about your property. That will generate an alert back to our community risk reduction division for verification. All of the attributes that are listed are either scientifically proven through national research organizations like the IAFC or an NFPA, or also locally considered factors that we selected. Also, we're going to be able to collect information for those property owners if they would like to be added to a database for future communications from the fire district. One of our goals will be to establish fire safe councils and also fire wise communities throughout the district. That will also allow us a lot more project work and interaction with the communities. Currently we have no fire safe councils within Metro Fire and no fire wise communities. We're probably one of the largest fire districts in the state that don't have that mechanism. As I said, we can verify the homeowner's information. I'm gonna cut the video there Future opportunities, as I've discussed, grants are going to be highly, highly, highly requisite for our success. There's three areas. Right now, fire prevention and safety, which is what we got our CWPP grant underneath, pre-disaster mitigation grants, and also hazard mitigation grants. The last two are where our community members are really gonna see benefit. That's where, between us and our partners like Sac County Regional Parks, we're gonna be able to go out and make a difference, do the, uh, vegetation reduction, the fuels reduction, and also one of the real popular plans right now is wood roof replacement for communities that have a high need for that. They're located within a wildland urban interface. In the future, we hope that that's somewhere that we can take the district and provide that back to our community. And that is the end of the presentation. I uh, would like to thank uh, everybody in CRD, especially Chief Daniels, uh, Deputy Chief Cockrum, and all of the uh, command staff for supporting me in this project. It's actually my last day. Um, I'll be continuing on it, but uh, I really appreciate the confidence that they all had in me working with this. Deputy Chief Holbrook shared a ton of information and uh, also the support of Chief Anke. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question in terms of public access to this information. Um, so I'm gonna buy a home uh, I can go to this and look to see what the level of fire danger associated with that site is. That is correct. Um, there's gonna be two logins. One, the public portal will not have a login. You'll enter in your address information and you'll have to put in some verifying information to prove that it's you or that you have a vested interest in that property. Internally, we're gonna have access to a whole lot more information, but that's not gonna be publicly readily available or accessible. So I, if I understand what you just said, I couldn't go and say, gee, I'm looking at this address and, and get that piece. Could I identify the general area? Absolutely. Uh, and that where go, that's where it goes to those 
color graded scales where you saw a neighborhood that was generally more red or right. less red, that'd be a higher danger to a lesser danger. Okay, next, next question. Those uh, color designations, are they seasonal or annually assigned or how is, how is that done? That is done assuming during the most critical fire season point locally that that is the highest risk you will achieve in a 12 month period. And the reason is we don't have remote automated weather stations here in right. Sacramento County. So we can't update that on a, on a daily or seasonal basis. It's also done on some of the fuel modeling. There's a few radar systems that were used to determine what type of vegetation is, is actually on the ground, the amount mm -hmm. of vegetative coverage, and all of those factors were combined. But to make it the most accurate, we didn't want to show that there's, you know, use data collected in December because there's really relatively no, generally, no wildfire risk in December. In July, August, September, that's where we pulled the data from. Okay, and, and my last question here is, uh, to you as a firefighter, <laughs> excuse me, as a firefighter, um, when a call comes in, is this relevant to look at what kind of fire danger uh, the, the call is located in? There's two questions, or there's, there's two ways to answer that. The first is, as a fire captain, I'm going to look at my first in run area, and I'm gonna try and look at that area, that modeling, and know where my higher risk areas are. It will show topography, it might show me something that I can't see from general driving around on the streets. In an operational response mode, there's probably not enough time to pull up and figure out mm -hmm. specific attributes for any single parcel or any single structure. However, on an extended duration, because of the pre-planning tool that we have, we can start putting in some of the uh, water sources, uh, the resource and division assignments, some of that stuff further on. Great, thank you. Please. <coughs> Captain Vessel, I had the pleasure of attending one of your one-day sessions, and uh, I, I just wanted to commend you and your staff for a fine job. Uh, I, I love the data gathering and the use of data that you're talking about. But uh, what I saw was uh, 35 or 40 of my fellow residents that were sitting in a room with you for a day, you and your staff, and were greatly moved by uh, specific practical measures that they could take to protect their homes and their area. And I think this is the sort of thing that's gonna pay great dividends for us, and I really appreciate the efforts of you and your staff. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Please, Director Pierce. Of that $1 million grant, how much of that will cover ongoing costs, or do you know what the <coughs> ongoing cost of this will be? Currently, the GeoPortal is really the only ongoing component of this plan. We have the GeoPortal itself, a subscription for a room, uh, 19 remaining months. The rest of it, the grant period ended on, will end on April 30th. We've applied for an extension so that we can get the public comment period extended into July. Um, the ongoing portion of this really relies upon the future funding, the future grants, and the future project work. And that doesn't necessarily rely on Metro Fire to do. A lot of the project work will be, in fact, completed by the HOAs, the community groups, American River Parkway Foundation, uh, county regional parks, and a lot of the other stakeholders. We'll be a partner. It's my personal hope that we are able to assist them and facilitate a lot of their action but there's a lot of players that will bring a lot to the table in the future. In fact, one of our consultants' major comments is that a CWPP is the, really it's the golden ticket to federal funding opportunities in the wildfire arena right now for mitigation. Thanks. Uh, I would just uh, add, <clears throat> if I may, Mr. President, um, my thanks to uh, Captain Vestal and the whole staff over in Community Risk Reduction. I mean, this is, uh, a phenomenal um, deal that they've done. I was at uh, Metro Chiefs Conference when it was brought up two years ago, brought it back. They, working with Larry Davis, filed for the grant, got the grant, brought the grant in, and we will take advantage with our excellent grant writing staff and Mr. Davis and, and his team and uh, Captain Vestal on obtaining as many grants as we possibly can and actually moving this into the hazard reduction and mitigation uh, section. So we are gonna be moving forward in that arena. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. Moving on to the action items, 
The first action item is the uh, amendment to professional services agreement for Muni Services. Chief Holbrook. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. What I have before you tonight is What I have before you tonight is an amendment to an existing contract, and that amendment is brought forward due to a change in the scope of work. Uh, several times tonight we've talked about data. The amendment for this particular contract has to do with the data relative surrounding the 210,000 parcels. What we've done is increase the scope of work to include um, identification of adjacency issues for common ownership, um, in addition to um, our ability to really run them through several layers of sieves to find um, no matter how I want an answer, an end product like a report you saw tonight, that I have the data sorted appropriately. Um, Muni Services has um, done this report, uh, this data collection for us for the last uh, year, year and a half, and they will, at the same time that they sort this data, will run this year's new data um, at this, the exact same time. Hence, what you have before you is an increase in scope of service, which is an amended amount of $127,000. That amount will be fully accounted for within the mid-year budget review, which occurs next Tuesday. So with that, I'll answer any questions. Make a motion we adopt. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Quadruple. Would the clerk call the roll, please? Directors Monk. Aye. Wood? Aye. Scheidegger? Aye. Gould? Aye. Pearson? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Jones? Aye. Orzali? Aye. Motion passes. Moving then to the Industrial Disability Retirement with uh, Chief Wells. Good evening, Directors. Mark Wells, Deputy Chief of Administration. Um, tonight, after a discussion and closed session, um, I'd like for you to consider adopting a resolution finding Captain Gordon MD has suffered a job-related injury and directing staff to work with Captain MD through his industrial disability retirement process with CalPERS. Oops, so moved. We have a motion and a second. I'll second. Okay. And with that, uh, would the uh, clerk call the roll, please? Director Monk. Aye. Wood. Aye. Scheidegger. Aye. Gould. Aye. Pearson. Kelly? Aye. Jones? Aye. Orzali? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Moving into the President's report to make this brief, I want to thank each of the speakers who came this evening. Uh, input from the public is critically important to us, and we greatly value their taking the time to be with us um, this evening. And with that, I'll conclude the President's report. Going on to the Chief's report. Uh, yes, Mr. President, Board of Directors, first off, uh, in your packet, I believe you received, if, if not in your packet, you received it last week, a correspondence from Mr. David Warren of Citrus Heights talking about the proposed medical facilities building uh, that's going to be built on the, is being proposed to be built on the Citrus Heights uh, <clears throat> property where their current city hall is located. And his concern was that uh, it would not be paying property tax the way they have it structured. And uh, as I talked to uh, uh, Mr. Warren, I let him know that we've been working very closely with Citrus Heights. They don't pay tax now. So whatever they reconfigure the property for uh, under their lease agreement, it really has minimal or no effect on Metro Fire. But I told him we would uh, keep him in the loop. So I called him personally on that issue. Um, in regards to uh, uh, last week I attended um, or two weeks ago, I can't remember now, the Cal Chiefs uh, uh, 2014 Quarterly Presidents Forum. I sit on the executive board of Cal Chiefs representing the Metro Chiefs of California. Uh, that was a very successful uh, uh, planning session. Uh, big issues to, to facing the state of California as far as the fire service. The ones probably nearest and dearest to us is uh, 201 rights and EMS issues in regards to uh, our ability to deliver emergency medical services to our citizens. Um, the other thing that I'm very, very proud of, and I want to thank Chief Holbrook for filling in because the date was set uh, uh, before I was there. Uh, I'd already had a uh, family plan, but that has to do with the fill the boot that was held on February 14th through the 17th. And uh, 
they have raised, uh, to this date, the Burn Institute has raised $107,960.05 with more to come in for the fill the boot. And it couldn't be for a better cause, I think, in the entire country of what the, the Burn Institute, uh, Local 522, and all the firefighters do to raise money and all the citizens that drove through Sunrise and Citrus Heights and threw money in the boot. Now, of course, as you know, there's always the Chief's Challenge, so though I wasn't able to be there, through your generous donations and command staff, which I want to thank, and, and uh, including myself, writing a, a nice little hefty check, uh, we were able to salt the boot ahead of time, as is our standard, and again, for, I don't know, the fifth or sixth year in the row, we won the trophy uh, for the uh, Chief's Challenge um, with a grand total of $1,735.68. So I really want to thank uh, Chief Holbrook and, uh, and his staff and everybody for contributing. And uh, it's always nice to get that trophy carved with our name on it again uh, mm -hmm. for another year. I was a little worried this year because we had uh, our former Assistant Chief Dan Haverty, Fire Chief of Folsom now in Sacramento was competing. And uh, you know I figured he was going to really be in the running there, but we were, won it pretty handily. Uh, Mid-year budget meetings, um, we've already held one with uh, senior staff. Um, we will be next meeting on uh, March 4th, and Director Jones will be present uh, per Director Scheidegger's recommendation last year about having a board member sit in. Um, and Director Jones is very appreciated to give up her vacation time to do that in retirement. Um, that was, uh, yeah, so anyways, um, we will be doing our mid-year. Uh, I will say that we are holding our own. I don't want to make any uh, pre pre uh, judgments, but things are looking pretty good here at the mid year level for us, and that'll kind of be the finalization uh, for us. Uh, upcoming meetings, I will be addressing the Contra Costa County Fire Chiefs Association with Chief Clough on emergency medical issues. They have come up here and looked at our dispatch center. Uh, the public should know out there that the JPA, uh, us, the City of Sacramento, Folsom and consume this fire protection district belong to a JPA dispatch center that sends the very closest unit to your emergency no matter what jurisdiction you live in. It doesn't matter what boundary, so we try to get you the best service that we can. Um, and so we'll be down there. They came up here and looked at that. We'll be down there talking about uh, GEMT, EMS, and ambulance services. And we continue on the issue that you had before you tonight on the revenue enhancement. We continue dozens and dozens and dozens of meetings um, uh, sometimes even late into the evening uh, with community groups that we're meeting with in regards to the revenue enhancement idea. Save the date on March 28th is the Sacramento Metropolitan Firefighters Association retirement dinner at the Croatian Center. At 6 p.m. I encourage the board please be there. The, the uh, district is contributing this year for the first time. I think we contributed some last year, but this time significantly we didn't think it was right to have a retirement dinner that was hosted by the association and not us thanking our, our employees. And last but not least, we have a recruitment for air operations, uh, ranks of captain, engineer, and firefighter for paramedic aerial observer. Uh, that'll close on March 5th. Also, uh, 2014 fire captain promotional examination. It goes off on April 11th. Um, and battalion chief's promotional exam, or they close on April 11th, and the same thing for the battalion chief's exam is on April 11th. Uh, with that, um, I would just like to personally thank uh, the civilian staff that works in this building, uh, my secretary, Jill Guzman, Brenda Briggs, uh, finance, Rhonda McFarland and her staff, uh, uh, Sarah Ortiz, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss the names here, in finance and IT, human resources, uh, Chief Wells people, uh, the civilians. Um, have really worked themselves to the breaking point in this organization. They don't show it to you. Uh, they just continue to do their job. But we cut the administration in half. And all this stuff that you've seen that's coming to you, they're trying to do. And some of them, a payroll the other day worked till 2 o'clock in the morning, three people, to try to get a new modernized ENCODE system in so that we can make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. The week before that, they're working 50, 60 hour weeks. Mm -hmm. These are not people that get overtime. They're salaried employees that come in. That's what they do. 
And, uh, you know, uh, whether it's my secretary, whether it's Brenda Briggs, whether it's uh, all these people I talked about, um, they give a lot that a lot of the people out there, even in the fire stations, certainly community never see. And if it wasn't for them, we would not be able to function. It's just the way it is. So I wanted to close with thanking them. And uh, that concludes my comments. Thank you. President Arzali, uh, Chief Hinkey, uh, directors. My name is Darren Taylor, an assistant chief operations. I'm here tonight to just to kind of maybe answer a question that you might be having. Uh, due to the, or actually the thank you of the leadership of the senior staff, which are the deputies and the fire chief, they've seen the value in providing some mentoring down to the ranks below their ranks to prepare the upcoming chief officers and staff to have the uh, ability to come in here and do some administrative work. And part of that, we've seen the value of allowing some of the line battalion chiefs, which you've seen come up here periodically to give an operational report. Um, so, the, so in case you had the uh, question into your minds of why are they coming up here, it's to provide them the opportunity to take part of this because we've seen a value in it. So on occasions you'll see floor battalion chiefs or the line battalion chiefs coming up here and giving you the operational report and uh, we think it's going to be a success for them to prepare them to come up here just like Chief uh, Holbrook has allowed me to do to get over the part of public speaking. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and sit back down and uh, Chief Johnson will give you the operational report. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. President, Board of Directors, Maurice Johnson, Battalion 5 on B-Shift. I'll be giving you your operational report tonight. It is short. Since your last meeting, we've had 12 structure fires, 2,704 medical dispatches of which 74% were transported. Our partner EMR had uh, three dispatches and they were transported 100% of the time. Uh, it is with deep regret that I report to you tonight the passing of Melissa Plessis, the retired wife of Deputy Chief Dennis Plessis. With that, that's the uh, end of my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have no council's report tonight. And um, then moving uh, to uh, uh, Firefighters Local 522. Uh, Vice President Bailey. Good evening, President, Board of Directors, Fire Chief Hinky. Um, I just wanna say a couple of things. First of all, thank Everyone for the presentations tonight is very informational. I hope that our line personnel will be watching this tonight to get a little bit of education on what's going on within the district itself. And also, I'd like to thank everyone who showed up at the boot drive. Um, pretty incredible through this year. I don't know if Chief Hinky stated, but so far, we've actually raised 50% of what we made all total of last year, and that's including all the satellite boot drives. So that's very impressive. And uh, that's a great cause, so I appreciate that. On April 2nd, for each of you and all local officials that'll be watching this, we have a Fire Ops 101 that Local 522 is putting on. It's separate from the CPF Fire Ops 101, which is in March. This will be for local elected officials to come down to the Brickyard at McClellan and participate in live fire training uh, with myself as well as all the directors and there will be several Metro employees also out there with the uh, Folsom, El Gro excuse me, consume this, uh, the airport and Sacramento City Fire. So I look forward to seeing you all out there. You don't have to participate, uh, but you're encouraged to, so. You'll have a medic, right? We will have a, a few medics there. Not for me. <laughs> uh, lastly, we had our uh, OPEB oversight committee. I wanna thank CFO Rhonda McFarland, Director Kelly, myself, Chuck Ingram, who represents the retirees. We are fully funding the ARC, and that's very important, not only for future employees, but for our, our current employees to know that we are dedicated to that. And by lowering the ARC, we are gonna be able to pre-fund that, hopefully within the next five to 10 years, where it'll pay for itself. And that's very, extremely important when you look at the healthcare and how it continues to rise on a yearly basis. And with that, that ends my report, unless you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you.
Moving then to committee and delegate reports, the executive committee. Uh, the executive committee met with the uh, uh, purpose of um, further defining the process by which uh, legal counsel to Metro Fire would be um, assessed and evaluated. Um, no final decisions were made. And um, the next meeting of the executive committee has uh, to be determined. Moving then to the Communication Center JPA, Chief Cochran. Yeah, President Orzali, Director Scott Cochran, Deputy Chief of Support Services, and we had a Communication Center meeting on Monday, or I'm sorry, Tuesday. Um, one of the uh, items that was presented was an end of year report. Our new executive director has actually been there about a year now. Um, they've had a lot of momentum over there. They've done a lot of work, but uh, I pulled a few statistics out for you to get a look or just to kind of get a hear of what it is that they're achieving over there. Um, in the 12-13, they uh, dispatched uh, 156,620 uh, emergencies. Um, that's up from 150,000 the previous year, so that's about a 6,200 call um, increase. They take and deal with about 31,000 calls on average per month. Uh, they have a 98% customer service, uh, positive customer service rating. They answer 99.65% of their calls within 40 seconds. Uh, they had uh, last year in 12-13, they um, used their emergency uh, medical dispatch services to assist with 22 childbirths. And they had what they would consider um, 74 CPR saves. To them, what that, re what that means is, is that with these 74 people, that means that they um, were admitted to the hospital. So they left, left the emergency and were admitted in, into that. Um, they have set up uh, for the first time a full disaster recovery um, area that there, so we now have a full disaster recovery that was visited by, it's been visited by myself, but uh, also operations chief of the Sacramento Fire Department, Lloyd Ogan, was participated in a training exercise they had, and it worked um, fully functional and flawlessly. So we got a, a great site for that now. Um, and they are going to actually do another full failure test where they're gonna have to shut down our current set center and move to the disaster recovery site, and that'll happen in the next couple of months. Um, their CAD RFP for us, the CAD RFP is in its final form and uh, is getting reviewed to be submitted and or put out published so that we could uh, get our new CAD. And that should be happening in the next couple of months. And uh, we approved a dispatch. Um, they've done a lot of work over there at the com communication center. That center has not had a lot of upgrades since the early 90s. So they were, um, they've done a lot of work in redesigning their GIS area so that they can better function and communicate. Matter of fact, we took their model and redesigned our te technical services division based on what we saw over there just for better communication. And they are now upgrading all of their workstations in the actual communication center part to make it all more ergonomic and better communication and so that they could do a variety of things. So is that a wrap up for me there? <laughs> there you go, Matt. Okay, I'm leaving. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Chief. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Chief. <laughs> so, uh, with that, the California Fire and Rescue Training JPA with uh, Director Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the JPA. The JPA has not met since I last reported out, and we are scheduled to meet on the 27th of March. Thank, Thank you. you. And moving to the uh, Finance Committee with Director Jones. Finance Committee meeting uh, next March 13th at 5 o'clock. Any interested parties with interested items for the agenda, please contact me. Moving then to the Policy Committee with Director Pearson. Uh, we met today to go over to board policies, and we decided we're going to send one to the Finance Committee on their charter so that they can uh, review that and rewrite that. We also met on the uh, LLR, the yeah. Yeah, uh, award, and I think we came close to finalizing that. And we, outside of that, we will be meeting again March 27th at 5 o'clock. Thank you. 
then uh, moving to uh, board members uh, questions and comments and we'll start with uh, director jones thank you very much uh, looking forward to our march 4th budget review committee yeah it's probably about a couple five gallons worth of water i'm carrying there for our former finance uh, chair thank you very much but i am looking forward to it and a reminder this saturday march 1st crab feed for the burn institute st john vianney's um, I hope I see a lot of familiar faces at my table. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, we'll move to Director Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Mr. Paint for being here this evening. Uh, Mr. Paint lives in the district that I represent. And uh, pleasure to have you here and hear your comments. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Mr. Uh, Mc Mr. Geary and Mr. McGuire. Uh, their reports, uh, it's tough to hear that, that information. Uh, having in the former district that I represented uh, that included station 654, uh, 54 had been closed and I think an ambulance unit runs out of it now or it had switched one day on or a couple days on. Uh, and then uh, and then that was in the district uh, seven at the time and then 102 was closed. So having uh, actually felt the, uh, uh, the pain, so to speak, or the, uh, the results of the downturn in the economy and the loss of revenues experienced by this district, it was, uh, it's one of those things where CityGate actually was the study that we used to make those decisions. And, uh, I'd be hard pressed to think that you uh, you could find a single person that lives within a stone's throw or maybe a a, a good uh, four iron from either of those houses uh, that felt equally as safe as they did before they closed, and so the response times in that uh, in that South Watt area and in that uh, Arden Arcade slash Carmichael area. Uh, mm -hmm just the residents there are not served as well as they once were. So uh, I would certainly look forward to seeing us have an opportunity uh, to gain uh, revenue through the assessment. And if those houses aren't opened up again, certainly other engines and services restored in our area that will better serve the, uh, the residents of the districts that e any one of us represent. So I think it's a very good uh, opportunity to uh, at least have the conversation on the tools that we have at our disposal to try and continue uh, to lessen lessen the uh, the cuts that we may or the decreases in service that we may experience with declined property tax revenues, and uh, really make sure that we're able to serve the people that we represent. Thank you. Thank you, Director Pearson. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention again to the public that this benefit assessment doesn't come lightly. And I think most people would sit at home when you're not using the service and assume that it's good. And, and it is. We have very professional people working for this organization. They do a great job. But I think uh, Mr. Rice <laughs> gave an example, and he knows the system. And you're affected when you call. That's when you find out that there's deficiencies. We sit up here, and we know there's deficiencies. And... It's difficult to kind of get that across because firefighters have such a good reputation. When our men and women show up to the house, uh, they're very professional and they do a great job. A few weeks ago, I had uh, uh, the need to call upon the, uh, the services and uh, people came out and they were helping my friend out and very professional, very, very nice. Um, but it was in a neighboring jurisdiction had to come because the engine that services my area was busy. And so it wasn't a SAC Metro uh, engine. And the neighboring agency, they are a good, or, a good organization. Um, they're not Metro, but they're good. And I was appreciative of them coming. But I think, again, that comes to, you know, I'm sitting at home. I could dial 911. I'm assuming I'm going to get SAC Metro at my house. I'm assuming I'm, that's what I pay for. Come to find out, I call 911, and it's not SAC Metro because we are so busy. We are so understaffed. And this benefit assessment, although it will not get us to where we need to be, um, I think the people will see a quicker response. But when you talk about firefighter safety, 
it doesn't really address that. It does to a degree, but we still are not getting the bodies on scene quick enough to uh, provide the safety that I would like to see for the people that we ask to go in a harm's way. But at least will give us some sort of a stop get. It's a start. Um, but I, I just want the people at home, it's, you know, that they're sitting at home right now thinking, yeah, everything's good. I'll call 911, I'll get an, an engine and an ambulance. And you will, eventually, you will get one. We will send somebody. Um, if your house catches fire, yeah, you will get a response. But I would prefer to have that response ready to go and uh, in a timely manner. So I'm looking forward to working with the staff and the citizens in my area to kind of get the information out there to show them what, what the needs really are because I, I think most people do not understand how short we are and how much we're doing with so little. Uh, they just don't get it until they call on those services. So that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Director Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First off, my thoughts and prayers are with the Plessis family this evening at their time of loss. I'd like to thank the citizens of this community for their uh, continued contribution to fill the boot. I mean, it is amazing to me year after year how we, we exceed that $100,000. And if you could meet one of the, the children or the people that benefits from the Burn Institute and the changes it makes in their lives, you'd, you'd give all you have. I'd like to thank those men that came up here this evening and gave us presentations on revenue to service reports. At the end of the day, it all boils down to response times. That's it. It's not very more complicated than that. That's the business we're in. And everything we do at this board level and all the men and women that work with us are all about response times. Everything else is just kind of fluff when it comes to what we do outside of response times, because that's what you pay for and you expect when you call for our services. At the end of the day, these nine men and women that sit up here will make decisions that will maintain Metro Fire's vanguard status. He said it tonight, it's absolutely true. We set the pace in California Fire Service today with the leadership that we have, with the men and women that we work with, the, with the leadership of our labor group, they get it as well, but we will do what we need to do with the support of the citizenry as we go about looking at how can we maintain that vanguard. I hope that the men and women or the, the people that listen to this presentation tonight understand that we do not take it lightly. It's a very serious thing for us to ask the citizens to go into their pockets and pull out a little bit more money to maintain the vanguard fire service they have come to expect. And so I call for everyone in this community to look closely at what we're doing, analyze it the way you want, but it, and ultimately get behind and support this because it's all about response times. And we can't maintain those if we don't continue to get the help we need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Scheidegger. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, we did receive two excellent reports tonight. I'd like to thank CityGate and Wildan for Good work. Um, and I, I'd like to thank Ms. Klinger for her comments. Um, uh, as I suspected, uh, really what you're talking about in my mind is the intersection of that red line and that blue line on that chart that talk about expenditures and revenues. And it is our responsibility to make sure that we're doing everything we can to stay within the guidelines, to stay within the parameters of what we have to run this, apart this department effectively. And I think we're doing that, we're demonstrating that. I think this objective approach and look at the data is very helpful, be helpful to our community. And the other comment that I wanna make about that is I appreciate the strict adherence and concern that we're showing to the legal parameters in terms of making sure that we're following the, our uh, objectives there. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, uh, commend Chief Holbrook for so effectively dodging the traffic out there. I, uh, I almost hit you but you, you did a good job, good jumping. And then last, on a personal note, I'd like to uh, welcome Madeline Ann, my uh, two-day-old granddaughter, into the world. Future firefighter, I think. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Director Wood. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Chief Holbrook and your staff, pass down to Captain Markle, the good work in making these accommodations come up. It's been great, I don't think there's been more than a month, month and a half that passes that we don't have somebody in here that we're recognizing. It's great that staff takes the time to let you know 
and, and that we can get these things done and recognize people for their hard work. Um, I also want to thank Ken Payne uh, and Ms. Klinger for their comments. Um, I hope, Mr. Payne, you got your, co your answer, questions answered and you're able to make the decisions you need to make. Uh, Mr. Rice, appreciate your comments and much like uh, Mr. Rice says, I've got some responses uh, for Ms. Klinger from a personal note. Uh, some of the comments she made are comments that I, I j have a very difficult time with. Um, Anybody who doesn't understand what the pe men and women of this department have given up over the last six years just needs to ask somebody with a badge on. They'll tell you what they've gone through. Ask Ty Bailey for five minutes. He'll sit down and tell you the cuts, the, what they've given up. And, and you will see that there's nothing left there to, for us to do. I live in a section like Director Kelly that's been affected by a station closure. In 2009, we still had 68 out here in southeastern Rancho Cordova and I had to call 911 for my son who was in the middle of a seizure. It took them about three and a half, four minutes to get to my house. I think it was closer to three, my wife says four. She was a more coherent one at the time, so I'll, I'll go with three and a half, but it took them about three and a half minutes to get there from 68 to my house. And we had to go code three to the hospital and the whole way there, those men and women of 68 were absolutely phenomenal. They spent more time and probably more energy taking care of me than they did my son. Um, when 68 closed two years later, the Southeast Rancho Cordova lost a very, very vital part of our, our economy, our, not our economy, excuse me, but our community. Now, people in my community, people in Southeast Rancho Cordova, if we have an emergency like that, our closest station is over here on Kilgore and White Rock, 66. We have to wait, and assuming they're not busy, if they're busy north of the freeway or somewhere else, we could have a 10 minute response time to get us uh, response from station 62 on Bradshaw, 58 out in Slough House, or even as far as Excelsior and Gerber on 55. So getting these stations open is, is essential to us. It's essential to the members of our community. I've long said I would pay $100 a month, $100 a year to get 68 back open in my neighborhood. And I, I can't be more behind this uh, assessment than I, I am. And I think it's great that the reports and the materials that the department has gone through and obtained are available for everyone's view. They should be looking at them, and like the prior director said, it's a, they've done a great job getting there. So any questions, always ask us, and we'll be happy <coughs> to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Director Monk. Well, I appreciated all the presentations made this evening. Uh, I agree with Director Wood. There's a ton of information that's been put out for us to consider and for us to review and I appreciate all the hard work putting that together. On a final note, I want to again say thank you, congratulations to our Life Saving Award recipient for her efforts in uh, the Denny, Denny's incident. Uh, not many people come forward in an emergency and know what to do or whose family will jump in and help out and uh, she deserves a lot of recognition for stepping forward and helping out in those situations. So, Absolutely. Again, congratulations. That's it. Thank you. Uh, in a little uh, uh, irregularity here, I have another uh, speaker who has asked to, uh, to address the board this evening, and uh, so I'd like to go ahead and do that in, uh, in deference to a citizen taking the time to come to the uh, meeting. So, uh, Mr. Osborne, Mr. Craig Osborne, if you would uh, come up, please. Thank you, Mr. President and directors, uh, especially for the uh, extra accommodation. Um, my intention had been to be here a couple hours ago when the meeting started, and I was delayed by a prior commitment that um, took much longer than anticipated. Certainly. Um, and I will uh, keep my remarks brief. Um, my name is Craig Osborne. I am the president of the Homeowners Association in the Anatolia neighborhood. Um, I want to start by saying thank you uh, to the men and women of this district for the work that you do every single day protecting our lives and property. Um, I don't know how often you get thanked. Uh, I'm sure it's not enough, so thank you. Second, I would like to thank the district for doing all that you could have done over the uh, years uh, that 
several recent years of the recession to recognize the importance of looking at costs and the importance of making the right adjustments for efficiency, um, for meeting your mission to the public, and for keeping costs as in line as possible with the revenues. Um, that's a different job than the day-to-day -day job of protecting lives and property. But you did it, and you did it well. So thank you for that second. Third, thank you for recognizing more recently than that, that in the long term, there was still a gap that despite cuts, which are always painful, and despite the improvement in efficiency, which is much needed and appreciated by the community, there was still a gap, and by taking the long-term view over multiple years, the district recognized that there was still a problem that still needed to be solved. And, so thank you for that third. Fourth, thank you for having the courage and the integrity to recognize that we need to look at revenue and we need to do it in a professional way for taking the high road and seeking out and finding and engaging the right professionals externally to come do the right things, look at the right things, crunch the numbers, and come up with what really is needed. Fifth, thank you for having the courage and the integrity again for bringing all that analysis together, taking the disparate principles and disparate disciplines of engineering, of law, of public uh, tax codes that are incredibly arcane and difficult to work with even in a good day and bringing all of those pieces together and making out of that a way to help continue the services that you have promised and that you are going to continue to deliver to the community. Again, that's a very different task than what you do every day protecting lives and property. Speaking as a citizen, that's five thank yous and I will vote for this assessment, and I'm looking forward to reopening Station 68 in my neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, I'll make one closing statement. I wanna take just a moment to thank Director Scheidegger for reminding me of how important it is to actually read when you do spell check. <laughs> Um, and with that, I'll close this meeting. We are adjourned. Wow. <laughs> Inside. Inside.